So my name is Chris Dubois. I'll be presenting some very preliminary work with my advisor, Porrick Smith, on uh, latent set models. So to start things off, I will be talking about uh, representing communication data as co-appearance data, and I'll be motivating the task of inferring groups, both uh, in terms of the theory and ap possible applications. Today we'll be taking a statistical approach. In particular, we'll be developing a latent variable model after a quick illustration of the model, I'll uh, apply it to uh, analyzing email data. So, so to uh, start things off, get everyone on the same page, say we have six actors, and at some point in time we see maybe in a, an email that involves three of these actors. So formally this could be thought of as a two-mode network. One mode would be the individuals, the other mode uh, the emails, and here we have a hyperedge that links an email to a subset of the actors. So next we might see another email, and another email, <coughs> and over time we might see a sequence of these events, and here I, in this toy example I've weighted the edges by the number of times we've observed that. And uh, analyzing this sort of two-mode data has a very rich history in the uh, social network analysis literature. Uh, one, for analyzing co-appearance data, but I would say it's also been useful for communication data in general because it's uh, very natural for places where you have events that involve multiple people, like a broadcast message, an email with a single sender but multiple recipients, or radio, or uh, maybe a classroom where you have a teacher and multiple students. So. Uh, another way to put this is that we have settings where we usually do the analysis in terms of dyadic interaction, but really the behavior on the network is in terms of events that comprise a set of people. So a simultaneous event, set of people, so the response to quantity we're interested in are these hyperedges. Now, in this particular example, if, if we say uh, these are emails, one thing we might be interested in is given things we know about the event, who else might be uh, participating in this event? And if these were uh, pertaining to some sort of collaboration at a university, it might be helpful to know uh, the department that the individuals belong to. So say these people are all sociologists, computer scientists, statisticians. Knowing this uh, membership information, these, this affiliate, uh, affiliation to these uh, groups would be very helpful in explaining the pattern of interaction here. So that's the approach we'll take, that there exists some set of latent groups in this uh, population, and this is really not a new idea in sociology. So Zimmel, for example, said that people's social identities are defined by their membership to various groups, be it family, occupation, their neighborhood, and so on. Feld later said that uh, shared foci help explain dyadic interactions among actors, so these might be shared activities and interests, either known or unknown. <coughs> and uh, later Hamann said that groups of people are partially defined by their actions. So the takeaway is a very, very straightforward thought that there's a lot of intuition here uh, built up over the years that there exists possibly overlapping latent sets of people that help explain what's going on. Now, practically, I think there are a lot of applications for this. Uh, one you might have seen in email, if you use Gmail, they have a little app that helps suggest, given who you've put on the email so far, who else might be involved in this email. So this sort of, uh, man, this sort of little toy app can actually be very useful, and it can rely on methods that, statistical methods that can uh, come from this sort of framing of coherence data in the problem in general. Uh, another setting, or another possible application, is automatic group detection. So uh, on, with these online services, be it Facebook or Gmail again, people are generally unwilling to create man manually create their groups. So here I have my Gmail contact list, and I'm pretty lazy as far as saying, oh, this is my family, this is, these are my friends. I don't do it at all, in fact. But it would be helpful uh, because especially with Facebook, people often whine, well, I don't want to 
share this part of my life with this set of people, share this part of my life with this set of people, and being able to automatically define these realms of, uh, you know, these social groups could prove useful. Anyway, so where am I going to go in with this? Uh, we're going to come up with a statistical model, and the reason we take this approach is that we want to be able to make predictions about missing or future data. We want to explore scientific hypotheses, and we want to do this in a general and principled framework. Even in the case where we have missing data, sparse data, uh, just like uh, Mark had in his talk, a lot of missing data there. And uh, we'd like to be able to seamlessly incorporate additional covariates that we may have about the actors or events. And we'd ideally like to be able to scale this up to large dynamic data sets. So the model I'm going to present here assumes a few things. One, that these latent sets of actors exist in the first place. That events involve actors from one or more of these sets. And for a given set, each member has some probability of appearing. So taking this through the toy example I started with, on the left, say we have these six actors again. We have an email that uh, includes these three of them. Uh, what I'm assuming is that there exists a latent set where the people that have appeared are most probably uh, arising because that set is active for this event. So I find it useful to think about this in terms of matrices, actually. Uh, same thing, what I've drawn up here can be represented by this first row where we have a co-appearance matrix of events by people. So dark squares represent that they, they indicate that that person is there, present for that event. So these three people are present for this event. And what we're saying is that this can be modeled as saying a single set is active. So out of three possible sets, the first one is active. And the people that are most likely to appear are the members of that set. So here we have a set by people matrix events by set matrix. And to do another quick example, suppose we've observed this uh, event. The way we would represent this with the model, uh, so here's the event down here, these four people are present, is to say that these are the two latent sets that are active. So the two and three are active. And the most likely people to appear for this event come from the union of these two sets. So if we're going to actually write down a likelihood, here's uh, the form. I have omitted a, an epsilon in here just for uh, to make things a little more clear. And uh, to what these variables represent, wik uh, is the ith element of this w matrix. I'm calling this one w. So it represents, it indicates whether or not set K is active for event I. ZJK is, comes from this matrix, and it indicates whether or not person J is a member of set K. And then theta JK, uh, it's not quite on a probability scale there, but it indicates the strength of membership for uh, how much individual J belongs to set K. So in reality, the obser observations we get, we expect them to be a somewhat noisy version of these, the combination of these two matrices. And uh, to any statisticians in the room, th you might quickly realize the reason why we wrote this down is that we get conditional independence. And that makes things a lot nicer. So what that means is that every single observation, every uh, element in this matrix we're saying is conditionally independent given the parameters of our model. So that even in the case of missing data, we are still able to infer the parameters of our model and uh, make predictions about those missing observations. So as far as inference goes, we will take a natural, the natural approach and say that uh, assume these things, these latent variables exist and do data augmentation. Turns out EM is uh, pretty tricky, but we do do uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo and uh, in particular Gibbs sampling. Gibbs sampling is kind of nice here because we can integrate out a few things and uh, things go a little quicker. 
and uh, the way we make predictions is by averaging over samples from the Smarkov chain. Uh, it turns out that uh, some, sometimes it is helpful to do initialization, uh, good initializations, otherwise the chain is, it gets stuck in some local modes, but that's a side topic. So, uh, take this through a quick example. Uh, Davis, I think in the late 30s, maybe early 40s, collected data on the attendance of uh, women in the South to a set of, let's see, maybe 14 women attending social events. Uh, very classic data set in the social network analysis literature, and it's usually been used to test out methods that are directly applicable to TUMO data. So here I have the social events and I have the women and whether or not they went there. So after fitting the model with two latent sets, so setting that parameter ahead of time, this is the predictive distribution you get, averaging over a couple of samples. So you see some of the structure there in that uh, uh, it's placing more probability mass on this set of women attending this set of events, and likewise over there. And if you go and look at the, uh, a sample from these uh, matrices, so this is the set membership matrix, and this is which sets are active, you, you can kind of see the confidence that the model has in assigning these people to different sets. And this would agree roughly with uh, what the literature has suggested over the years when an am analyzing this data. Uh, and it might say a few more things. And uh, so it says, you know, these women are roughly, except for Pearl, these women are most definitely part of a set, nor might be one of that set, and so on. The point is that uh, we're able to easily, quickly use this tool to help with exploratory data analysis in this setting, kind of pull apart that uh, event matrix into uh, who belongs to what set and which sets are active. Yeah? What does the white box mean? I mean what does the what the mean? The white box. The white box. Like somebody that actually belongs to no set. Ah, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, so dark means that you do belong. And that, and over here it means that this set is active for event stuff. Yeah, but it, that, that's easy to understand. Oh, what, what, which like, white box? If say, if Flora, for example, she been to the meeting, why she's not the meeting set? Well, oh, I it's see. Not important. Uh, it's saying that. By okay, by saying that she is not a member of that set the model is suggesting that any time she appears is just by chance. Oh, okay. So that, and that's what I meant when I, there, in the actual model there's an epsilon over here which suggests that um, there's a small chance of <coughs> someone appearing uh, even if they're not a member of an active set. And just looking at the data, I mean, the, um, I mean these are individuals who don't go to a lot of parties. Right. So, I mean, this might be a case where if you had per actor fixed effects or something in there, that might clean some of that up. That's true. Because, I mean, they're clearly in, if they're in any group, they're in the second group, but they're just very tenuously attached. That's right. Uh, so, but, I mean, that would be enough. I mean, that would be a relaxation of a lot of modification of the data. So. Yeah. Uh, no, for this particular example, per actor effects would get you pretty far, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, considering <laughs> how many degrees of freedom you eat putting them in, of yeah. course, that's not a mess. That's right. That's right. Uh, so, one nice thing about having a probabilistic model like this is that we can evaluate our model predictively. So, uh, this isn't that satisfying of an experiment, but I deleted 25% of the edges, fit the model uh, on the network that was observed, went back and predicted the missing edges, and here's an AUC plot, which uh, is essentially the number of true positives for a given false positive rate, and this is you would hope to see, you know, curves up in this region, and we kind of see that. But more, again, this is preliminary. More work in this area needs to be done. Uh, for those familiar with the Enron email data set, it's um, over the last couple, the last few years of Enron, they went back and released everyone's email, uh, and 
you can download and such. So here I've fit my model with 20 latent sets uh, to that data, and here I've pulled out uh, information about one of those latent sets. So on the left here, I've taken the events that were assigned to a single latent set, where that one latent set was active, and I've sorted by uh, the strength of membership to that latent set. So what we'd hope to see is that there are a bunch of events where people on the left are very, uh, th there's a high probability of them coming, and we indeed see that. And over here, what I've plotted is uh, for those people who are members of the set, I've uh, plotted the observed count of how many times they appeared in an email when the set was active versus how strong the model said they belong to the set. And again, for a different latent, latent set here, uh, just to show that I wasn't cherry picking too much, it happens uh, over uh, most of the 20 sets. Again, you hope to see that the people on the left appear quite often and so on. The main takeaway here is that this, uh, this method is uh, pretty useful at pulling out some of the structure in this co-appearance data where you have sets of people who co-appear often together. So uh, wrapping up a little bit, advantages of this approach, uh, we argue that latent set models are a natural choice for co-appearance data. It's nice that we can validate predictively. Uh, it very easily allows for uh, missing data and egocentric data. And though we haven't done it here, we plan to extend it to allow for covariates at the events and possibly covariates uh, on the individuals. One uh, nice thing uh, for going for this approach rather than ad hoc methods that could be used is that these things are, these sets are quite interpretable. It's an inferred group of actors and you have a sense of uh, how likely each actor within each set uh, is, is to appear. Another, uh, another great thing about this is that it's far more scalable than some other approaches you could take. And one of the choices for the likelihood that we showed, the one minus x kind of thing, is specifically to try and enhance the scalability of this sort of model. So with that, thanks for listening. So I have a canned answer. <laughs> no, no. Um, as it stands, it's a, a choice made a priori, and you can kind of appeal to the the usual model selection tools. So, uh, alternatively, you can kind of go down this path and take it to be make it into a non-parametric model if you so choose, uh, where those binary matrices uh, can have a flexible number of columns if you want to go that route. Uh, right now, it, you, you choose it a priori. Did you try any different ones on the basis? Okay. I did, I did. Uh, the reason why I chose two is because over, over the last 70 years, that, that's kind of the, what people concluded, so I want to see how, what my model decided to do with two. Uh, with three, it, you get two strong uh, groups and then one noisy group kind of thing, that, that fringe of uh, people that you're not really sure which group they belong to. Any other questions? Well, I just thought it would be natural, just to follow up on it, natural to embed this uh, within a, a model where you did Bayesian inference, where you had random effects for the individual heterogeneity. In, for these class models, which you know, it's very common to have differential activity by the individual actors. So either fix or random effect here would be very helpful. And then uh, I see you're saying. So in a Bayesian setting where you could write down a model to know which classes, mm -hmm. such as a marginal distribution for them that you can select constantly. Mm -hmm. that would, Interesting. I mean, it would add a lot of computational 
fresh use, but in particular the issue that the multi modes are going to be very prominent here because yeah. of the identifiability issues of the classes. Exactly. So you have a label switching problem which is quite large here. Right. Which I'm sure you appreciate. Yes. So you could address within that model both the label switching problem and also the fact that you can move move away from multi modes and collapse it. So it's a lot more extra work, but it feels like a natural extension. Absolutely. So right now there is node level heterogeneity. So there is a, uh, a strength uh -huh. to which each individual can belong to each set. So there, right. so there is some of, that, what you're, some of what you're saying, but uh, a random effect model. So if we had some sort of linear predictor in here, right. and there were node level yeah. uh, random effects at that level, that would, I think that's a very interesting direction. I'd expect with this model, and this is a question then, um, you'd get s the sets would be strongly sorted by the activity of individual nodes. Is that true? Yes. So then that's and that's what we see here yeah. and here on the right. So yeah. so this is yeah. the activity, yeah. exactly what you said, yeah. sorted by. So that's trying to pick up that effect. That's right. Construction of the sets. That's right. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Line with the question about number of groups. Yeah. So one, one thing you have here that, that you often don't in, say, the community detection literature or other kinds of things that has the same issues is you, you can take advantage of the events here. Right? So, you know, imagine okay. that you put in a penalty. So, if two events have almost the same overlap in membership, you don't want to call those two different groups. Right? I mean, I can always get a perfect fit by just having as many groups as events and, and call each event its own group and then, you know, I, I, I've identified perfect. That's right. But but the penalty should be sort of, you know, if two events look very, very similar, then I in terms of the people showing up, then I, I really in some intuitive sense think of those as, as probably the same group. Absolutely. Uh, so and if you started thinking of it as just a you know, working with this probability of people showing up and then wanting events that have nearly the same people showing up to be the same group, then that should penalize, which would naturally put a bound on how many groups you Right, so, so you, you want to have some way of endogenously penalizing for over-identifying groups. And, and uh, you know, if, if, if I'm calling two events just because they had one person didn't show up at one and, and showed up at the other, but there were the same t other 20 people at the two events, then somehow if I'm calling those two different groups, I, I, I should be penalized for that. Too. Yes, so I'm hoping the model is doing some of that on its own already, in that uh, to that noise part of the model if we, have, we have, if we have a set that has 20 people, and then we observe one event that has those 20 people plus one over here, the other one, those 20 people plus one over here, I'm hoping that, and so far it seems it's doing most of this, it's calling that one set, and the noise term is, and those extra things are kind of being swept into the noise term. Right, I mean, it, but, it, it, so if, if you fix the number of sets yeah. a priori, then it's gonna try and put those two, you know, it, it's gonna right. identify those, but, you know, if, if you just un gave an unlimited number of sets, it would define those as two different sets. Yes, that's and, right. And so that's right. the penalty should be that, that in situations where it's nearly the same membership showing up, um, then in, intuitively that should be the same set. And so the fact that there's substantial overlap, I, I mean, it, it, I'm wondering if you can leverage that somehow to, to actually penalize the, the, the function. Yeah. No, that, that's a that's a good thought. Yeah. Any other thing on that? Well, in this case, you, you could compute uh, some approximate Bayesian information criteria precisely over the number of groups. It wouldn't be exactly correct, but it would be a good ad hoc criteria which you select on, and that would you know classic examples to plot that by the number of groups. Fit the model separately for each number of groups, compute the criteria, do a plot where you plot the number of groups and the <coughs> criteria, and it would say if you had two groups which were the same, that would adjust. Yeah. And BIC might be might do that by saying, oh, the the extra parameters needed for that additional set are not worth it. Kind of thing. But 
thinking you jerked it across this part. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. yeah but sorry, that's half inside joke. But that's actually, but that is seriously one. I mean, that's that's one way to do what you're talking about, which is which is pretty. And the computation of those is usually not. I mean, they're, they're in this kind of model, it's it can be, it's gonna be embedded naturally um, uh, in the MCMC. It's not necessarily too bad. Um, but it's, it's interesting. Though. It's not totally obvious to me that you would wind up with the phenomenon you're talking about because, because they, in a way, actually, you sort of save yourself by the kind of um, the, the fact that you don't have any. You know, sort of this, this independent structure, because of course if I start creating lots of little redundant things, since I never know which one will get activated, I could, I, they're, they're marginalized, right? I can't force a particular um, case to be depending on the thing. Um, anyway, it's not, it's not totally obvious to me that, that that's um, a problem, or if it is, you might be able to do it by forcing some additional restrictions, um, say random effect restrictions into the parameters, so that you know, if I try, I create lots and lots of groups because I don't know which one will get activated at a given point in time. I, I suffer predictive loss, um, so it's dangerous to have to try to overfit because I, you know, I never know which configuration will become active at a given point in time. So I have to trade off the fact that, like, if I have more particular cases, of course, in principle, I can ex activate exactly the right group of people. But then the more ways I have to activate the wrong right a group of people in any given setting, um, so that's another way to handle it with it within the model. So a lot of future directions for sure. Yeah. Any other questions? Thanks. Thank you.